Okay. Right, so uh, we're, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, I guess everybody can hear me okay. The microphone seems to be working. Uh, so, um, hello. It's, uh, it's nice to be here in Boston. Um, my first time here, personally. It's a beautiful city. Um, so, my name is Sean Handley. Uh, I work for a company over in the UK called Data Centered. Uh, we run an open stack based public cloud. Um, I personally have been working with OpenStack for about three years, and um, I mostly come from a web applications background, so my way of talking to OpenStack is all uh, API driven. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Tobias, and I work for a company called City Network in Sweden. We are also a public cloud based upon OpenStack. Uh, I've been working for, with OpenStack for about three years now, and uh, as Sean here, I'm, uh, I've also mostly been working with the APIs, and uh, my main focus has been developing our uh, cloud management system that we are using for managing our cloud. So, we are here today to uh, talk uh, about how it is to run a public cloud using OpenStack. So as we said, both uh, we at City Network and Data Center are uh, using uh, OpenStack as the base for our public cloud business. And uh, today we will cover uh, what life is li like behind the scenes. Yes, doing that, running a public cloud with OpenStack. And uh, just to have it said, this is not a sales pitch at all. Just so you know that, we just want to make OpenStack better for us as a public cloud provider. Yeah, in, indeed. I mean, ultimately, uh, it's kind of a scratch your own itch sort of thing. So um, we, uh, we want to focus on how to simplify life for ourselves and for other uh, public cloud providers, because uh, OpenStack is a wonderful toolkit, but we found that there are some gaps in it that uh, make our lives busier than we'd like to be. We're obviously very lazy people, you know, we don't like to be too busy if we can help it. So what we want to do is uh, start conversations, um, get ideas from the community about other features that may be missing from OpenStack as it stands and how we can fix that um, ultimately as a community together. So um, it's a bit late in the day. I'm sure everybody's starting to feel a little bit tired, so we're going to do some stretching exercises. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, by show of hands, um, hands up if you use OpenStack on a weekly basis or daily basis. So almost everybody, cool, no. okay. Um, hands up if you operate uh, an OpenStack cloud. Okay, mostly the same people. Yeah. Hands up still if it's public cloud. Okay, great, this is just the kind of room that we wanted. Yeah. Any um, upstream developers here? Okay, good. Excellent, the, cool. these are the people we need. <laughs> uh, Cool. Okay, so. So, the outline, just the outline for this presentation is that we will talk to you about very important stuff for, uh, yeah, about 30 minutes, and then we finish off by doing some questions. And, um, yeah, last year, uh, me and Sean met at the summit in Barcelona. It was the first time we met. And it became uh, pretty clear pretty quickly that we were doing yeah, about the same job on a daily basis uh, with plugging the gaps as we express it, uh, what we feel are missing in OpenStack for us as a public cloud provider. So that could be for performance reasons, it could be missing features or just things that don't work the way that we want them to work, that would be good for us. So this is how the world looks like that we created, right? Yeah, so um, we, uh, we, have, we have two layers here. We have the sort of, well, bluish layer here. This is OpenStack as you will recognize it. And then we have this red layer of magical proprietary code on top of it um, that gives us the abilities that we need to uh, run a public cloud business out of this. And without this magical layer, we'd, um, we'd actually have quite an impossible task of running OpenStack as a public cloud business because it just, when we first started getting into this about three years ago, it just wasn't all there. Um, so um, that's, um, that's how I started working with OpenStack. I got drawn into um, figuring out how we can 
get this up and running as quickly as possible. So rather than actually get involved with contributing code directly to OpenStack, I was like, hey, I know Ruby. I'm going to write some Rails applications and do all of this stuff. Um, so it's worth mentioning that um, when our users interact with our public clouds, they're not necessarily just doing it through the magical proprietary code stuff. They do actually have access to the APIs as well, and that's all exposed and unmodified. But for things like user sign up and some aspects of billing and quote um, assignment, we just had to have this magical proprietary code layer. Um, and this is where we live. This is where we spend most of our lives. Um, so uh, there's a problem with this, um, and that's that uh, magical proprietary code sucks. Um, we, we know because we wrote it. <laughs> Um, it doesn't benefit from the love and care of um, being out in the open source community. Um, you know, there could be bugs in it for a long time before even we realize it. Um, if we get hit by a bus, that's bad news because suddenly a large percentage of people who know this code well disappear. Um, so it's, it's, not really, it's not really an ideal situation for us to be in. So before we start talking about how we want to change things, um, we want to just do a little bit of um, information on how we think running a public cloud might differ from running a private cloud when it comes to OpenStack. Yeah, it goes without saying that uh, it's a difference between running a private cloud and a public cloud and a different challenge. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what difference make it necessary for us to create this? Do you say crappy code? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's one word. Proprietary code, I can code, think of at least, words. yeah. So, do you uh, have the... Oh, yeah, yeah go on. You, uh, you. you take the, the magic <laughs> device. Do you have these in the U.S., self-service gas stations? Yeah, you have. Good, good, good. So, in theory, everything should just work automatically, right? That it's, it's like the same in the public cloud. Users should just be able to come along, sign up, consume some resources, hopefully a lot of resources, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and pay their bill. Yeah, hopefully as well. And uh, yeah, and the reason for that is because it scales, right? Yeah. yeah, it's the only way it can work. Oh, exactly. So um, to be able to keep up with uh, the virtual uh, demands that comes along with this, we carefully need to add physical capacity along the way. So due to that, we care a lot about quota usage tracking, resource manage and ma ma management, and those kind of uh, things. And uh, uh, yeah, we, it's probably one of the most, yeah, it's, it's things what, that we could care about the most. It's actually. something that worries us, I guess, making yeah. sure we have enough quota. Exactly. So um, we also get these weird and unpredictable workloads. Um, we don't know what people are going to be using our cloud for because it's public. And if they're paying, then as long as they're doing nothing illegal, they can do what they like. Um, so we don't know what's going to be running on the VMs. We don't know uh, when there are going to be spikes in demand for us or how big those spikes are going to be necessarily. We do have relationships with some customers where we have some idea of what they might be doing. But generally, every day is a surprise for us. Um, and uh, this is my least favorite part, really. We, we have to stop people signing up and abusing the service, um, setting up spam servers, doing uh, other nasty things. Um, and it's, it's tricky, really figuring out what's actually going on on the cloud and what people are using it for. Um, we can do some things in the sign-up process to reduce the risk. Um, there are organizations who you can send IP addresses and emails to, and they'll give you some kind of risk score. Um, but that doesn't always work, and it's hard just keeping tabs on what people might be doing, because they might start out legit and then suddenly start trying to sneak in some spam along the way. Um, so we need to stop this happening for good quota management, and also just uh, because you know, we build people once a month. We don't want them coming in and using the system for a month, and then suddenly they're not paying us anything because that card's broken. Um, we get quite a lot of these every week, and it's, it's really annoying. I, I still don't know how to fix this, but it's uh, something that takes up too much of uh, certainly my life. I don't know yeah, about you, Tobias. Uh, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we get into the things that we think that we are missing in OpenStack, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that, you know, some good stuff about it as, as well. Since we use it to, yeah, it's, it's our bread. Oh. So, um, yeah, OpenStack is mostly a very good platform to run a, a public cloud with. It's, it's very easy, actually. And th that is for uh, several reasons. 
Um, it's a very large toolkit of very cool cloud features, as you said, very large toolkit. And um, yeah, this makes it uh, possible to uh, us to run a cloud that evolves um, together with the, with the users and uh, their needs and uh, don't fall behind and become obsolete in the end. So um, transparency, this is, uh, this is a great thing. If you can get to the code and the code is broken, then you can fix it. Um, half the time, if we realize something's broken, it turns out it's already fixed. It's just in a newer release than what we happen to be running. Um, personally, I think Garrett is uh, a little bit off-putting for a lot of people, but ultimately people, uh, people start using it. They get used to how you contribute through it, and once they realize that it can be done, and okay, it's not GitHub, but you know it works, um, it's, it's pretty much fine. Um, and if, uh, if people are technically competent, they can get in and you know, get their hands dirty and start fixing things. Mm. Uh, what was the next thing we were going to talk about? Oh, yeah, DevOps tools. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing that makes our DevOps team happy because there are so many deployment options and good automation tools for this. You, know, you can deploy uh, OpenStack with Puppet, Ansible, SaltStack, Docker, Packer, all kinds of other things. Um, more things than I care to really pay attention to. There are a million different ways to deploy code these days. I think we jumped away. Uh, no, no. Oh, no. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, open APIs. That make, uh, makes it possible for customers to, to manage their resources and, uh, from any applications that they want to, even if they have a, a proprietary code in their system that, Magical that, that proprietary. <laughs> does, does that for them. And uh, is no vendor lock-in. Uh, you can easily choose from uh, any cloud out there with the same uh, deployment code that you have to wh where you want to put your application. So uh, for that, it's a lot of good tools like Shade and uh, clouds.yaml, those kind of stuff. It's very good for that. So. Uh, going to kind of get to the, the reason that we wanted to have this talk now, really, and that we want to figure out, well, uh, what is missing? What do we think uh, isn't in OpenStack but should be, and how can we get it there? So for me personally, um, this is the really obvious one, and this is how I started getting involved with OpenStack. So has anybody ever seen the film The Hobbit? Yeah, a few nodding heads. So uh, we recognize this door, this magical door in the side of the mountain. Um, so. It's not something people consider too much when they're running private clouds, but if you're running a public cloud, there is no door in OpenStack. People can't just walk in and start getting involved because they don't have any credentials. So if they have no credentials, they can do nothing. So I, I was first hired to effectively build a door. Um, it sat um, on top of Keystone. It had its own um, Keystone admin account where it could create users. Uh, and then people would arrive on a page, um, put in their credit card details. It would go via Stripe. We'd, tick it off and say, yeah, OK, these are valid payment details. Um, and then they would be able to get into the system and do wonderful things with OpenStack. Um, so I don't see why we couldn't do this in Horizon and Keystone. I don't know if anybody's tried in the past. I've asked, and no one's really given me much of an answer. But I, uh, I don't see why we couldn't have some kind of sign-up flow mechanism where you could um, kind of pull out to things that you want to tick in the journey through to saying yes or no when somebody signs up online. So maybe you want to integrate with Stripe in some way. You want to integrate with MaxMine for uh, fraud uh, prevention, whatever other checks you want to have along the way. But basically, I, I don't see why there shouldn't be a way for people to arrive in the middle of the night and sign up on OpenStack without somebody um, answering the phone or responding to an email when they ask to get in. So uh, Tobias, do you want to talk about some uh, is this the quota stuff? This is the domain level stuff. Ah. So uh, one thing that we uh, think would be really hands uh, yeah, good for us is to have better domain level support. Policies at domain level so that we can let users do all the admin stuff at the domain level. For example, project management, create projects, delete projects. Uh, domain specific IP pools. It, it could be maybe authenticating to all different pro all the projects that you have inside your domain at uh, at once uh, it would probably save a lot of load uh, for keystone and um, yeah 
which will reduce a lot of the proprietary code as well that we have today. A lot of the so, code yeah. is deleting projects and that kind of stuff. Uh, also, quota management at the domain level. It would be much easier for us if we could just hand out some amount of uh, yeah, quota to one domain, one user, who can split that between the projects he decides to create. Uh, today we do a lot of yeah, quota management uh, behind the scenes for users, and uh, we don't want to do that. We want to do other fun stuff instead. Yeah, solve interesting problems. Yeah. We have been to a few sessions together here, and we also realized that uh, some of this is coming in, I think it is in the next upcoming release, uh, or Queen's in October. Yeah, Queen's so. is introducing hierarchical uh, quota support in Keystone. Yeah, so, so th that's going to make life much simpler for us. Yeah, it will, for sure. And uh, we also have the orphaned resources. Today, if you delete a project, all the resources that are behind that project will still be allocated in the system. So. This is something that we saw with medical proprietary code today. And uh, yeah, a couple of scripts will be needed for that. And um, that's nothing we want to do either. And um, it's also something that has been discussed uh, in Keystone as well. So hopefully we will see some results there as well for us. This, uh, this picture of Oliver is because these are orphaned resources, by the way. <laughs> so uh, when you delete a project, suddenly all of the cloud resources that belong to that project still exist, but you know, you've got to clean it up because it's taking up capacity on your hypervisors and so on. Um, I want to complain about Silometer. <laughs> Um, it, it, it does look like the telemetry project is going in a better direction, and I'm assured that it's uh, much more scalable these days. But boy, has this been a pain in the ass for us for such a long time. Um, we're, uh, what are we, Nick, around the Metaka level release for Solometer? Yeah, where are we? Kilo, okay. So um, we've, we've got this backed by Mongo, which was what we were advised to do several years ago. Um, pretty decently sized clusters. Um, the, uh, the ones that we're running at data centered, we've got uh, eight CPUs, 32 gig of RAM, SSD, um, and the ones over at City Cloud, I think are... It's a little bit bigger. I think it's 20, 24 cores and uh, 128 uh, gigs of RAM. Hmm. So th these are sizable machines. You know, they, they have some good we, horsepower yeah, to them. And good disks. Yeah. So um, any guesses how long it would take to return if you query it for one day's worth of uh, public cloud usage data? Any guess? No, nobody? Well, that's good, because we don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's um, a little bit of sort of pseudo Ruby code of me just getting samples from Silometer, and this is across everything. This is instances, volumes, images, Neutron stuff, everything. Uh, just querying it for a slice of two hours worth um, took 25 seconds. Um, S single instance? Hmm? Single instance usage? Uh, usage for a single instance? No, uh, for everything. For um, any, any event that's happened um, and been recorded by Silometer for two hours, 25 seconds. For four hours, we're up to 44 seconds. And for eight hours, uh, the gateway timed out. So we, we have to do some horrible things in just taking chunks of data and then aggregating data off that, and then we can actually turn that into something we can put into a billing system. Um, big problem with this is we can't give it to customers because um, it's just too slow. Um, and if too many people use it, then the whole thing grinds to a halt. It's just, uh, it's never, it's never going to work. Uh, hopefully, we can fix this. I mean, you know, we're paying close attention to what's happening in the telemetry projects. Yep. And, uh, Absolutely. you know, this, uh, this is the kind of thing that our bosses really want us to get right because, you know, if we can't bill people, we don't get paid. And, People get sad the when the customer does. Really likes when we build them right. As well, <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, they do. They don't like mistakes. Um, so yeah, hopefully this is all getting better. Um, I'd like to see this exportable in some kind of common formats that you could feed into invoicing and accountancy programs. I'm not sure if there are any standards particularly for that because I haven't started looking into it in anger. But it would be nice to just feed that into. Sage or Financial Force or whatever it is that the business has decided would be good for billing people with. Uh, Tobias? Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, uh, customers would like to consume any cloud anywhere. And uh, 
they would, yeah, it, it should be easy to switch between clouds. And uh, today what we see is that different clouds needs different parameters put into the authentication part. So when you're authenticating to Keystone, some clouds you, you will have to put in your product ID, your user ID, your domain ID, and uh, for it, in some other clouds, also running OpenStack, they don't accept those kind of things. You need to specify project name instead, and or tenant ID and product ID to be able to authenticate correctly. Maybe all of these clouds are doing it wrong, I don't know, but it creates a hassle for the customers when they are trying to con consume resources in different clouds. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we would like to have with, said with that is that some kind of more generic structure for authenticating to Keystone would be awesome, actually, and makes, it, makes the world easier for our customers, at least. Mm. And uh, yeah, security. Uh, with this slide, I don't want to say that OpenStack isn't secure. That's not about it. Uh, the security team is doing a great job with the uh, yeah, vulnerability management team. Uh, and uh, yeah. It's good, and uh, so, but, but we, we are missing a, a couple of features here, and one of those are two-factor uh, two authentication uh, together with Keystone, that would be great to have, and uh, also a decent VPN solution. Um, yeah, because the, the one we have right now, VPN as a service is left to die, and um, interesting session tomorrow about, uh, about that. And the one we have, the existing one is also has been a hassle for customers to, to work with. And uh, a lot of customers really uh, like to have a VPN solution onboarding into the cloud, and also when they are using multiple clouds and communicating between them. Um, a good audit trail will, would also be nice to have. Uh, logging whatever happens uh, from API point of view with your, inside your tenant would be great. And uh, also better separation of uh, inside the logs so that you can easily separate out all the logs for one tenant. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe even expose those logs to the customer if not, if it doesn't contain too much sensitive data. Okay. So um, how, uh, how do we close the gap? Uh, how do we fix these problems? Um, so uh, the answer is fairly straightforward. Actually, in uh, in the last uh, three, four months, about four months ago, um, the like uh, that, public yeah. cloud working group was established. Um, we're uh, we're still figuring out what our agendas are and what work we want to get done and and so on. But uh, the formation of this is uh, just bringing awareness to the community of things that um, OpenStack needs to have to better support public cloud providers. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're yeah. looking for more involvement. In we, we are, yeah. This yeah. is this is kind of a call to arms, really, for anybody else who's in a similar situation to us and doesn't want to keep duplicating workload and living in the magical proprietary code layer forevermore. Um, we, uh, we we want you guys to get involved. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you think is missing. If we've missed something that's important to you, um, and um, hopefully we can have some discussions about um, people actually developing. Um, developing solutions to solving these problems, yeah, really. Um, sorry, I think I just talked through your slide. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You did it well. We, uh, <laughs> it may not be obvious, because we're that good, obviously. Uh, but <laughs> we, uh, we didn't practice this at all. Tobias lives in Sweden, and I don't. So uh, sorry if we're a little bit rough around the edges today. <laughs> um, so yeah, we want to take our proprietary code and start porting those features into existing OpenStack projects. I'm not suggesting we form a new project, because I think there are way too many OpenStack projects anyway. But bringing things into the core projects like Keystone and Horizon and Nova and Neutron and stuff like this. Um, so th there is a little bit of a problem that we found so far in that most companies offering OpenStack public cloud are small to medium enterprises. They might not be able to sort of uh, get the money aside for paying for a full-time upstream developer to build features that suit public cloud providers. So I don't know, there might be a few ways around this. Maybe people could give 20% time to one developer and they could like spend one week a month doing this sort of thing or maybe one day a week, depending on how they prefer to work. Upstream Friday. Upstream Friday, yeah, absolutely. Pizza and beer. 
Yeah. And that's the way to get most things working when Even it comes better. to <laughs> changing things. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you work in a company that's interested in doing this and, uh, you know, talk to the right people and uh, hopefully many hands can make light work of these changes. Um, cool. So we're, uh, we're 25 minutes in. We're a little bit faster than we planned, yeah. um, but we're, uh, we're up to question time. So if anybody has questions, ideally come to a microphone, but if, uh, if you're too far away, just shout it out and I'll repeat it for the video camera. Yes. So for, uh, for the first uh, uh, problem you just mentioned, I think it's uh, about sign up, right? So you imagine there is no way for, for OpenStack as a public cloud for customer. Uh, so we have an internal product named Stack Task, so that you can, uh, uh, external customer can sign up, and after you sign up, you have the project manager role, and you can invite more uh, project members into your project. And we are going to uh, open source it in next couple of weeks, I think. And we are using it in our production environment. Uh, sorry, uh, we are a public cloud based in New Zealand. Uh, we're yeah, we're using OpenStack. So, and as for the quota policy stuff, uh, I think it's, it's it's happening, but it's very slow. So, don't expect it you know happen very soon. For example, in in grants. For now, I'm still um, uh, a core member of Glance. Uh, so for Glance, Glance is still using hard code quota, not like Noah, Cinder, and Neutron. So you can expect it's, it's still very slow to get a global uh, quota policy. Yeah. And as for VPN, as a service, uh, we, for now we have one uh, developer working on that, so it okay. shouldn't be die. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's good. good to hear. <laughs> what, was, uh, what was the name of the project you're open sourcing? Uh, for now, uh, internal we call it a stack task, but stack it's task. going to be uh, released with another name. We will send an email in the uh, OpenStack dial mail list and could be uh, op operator's mail list as well. Excellent. Cool. Uh, and uh, as for Salometer, we are, we are running into the same problem. It's you know, very, very slow. But as for billing, if you want to just use the, uh, the metrics from Cellometer for billing, I assume you will have another uh, billing system to get the metric uh, samples from Cellometer, for example, uh, per, per hour or per two hours. Mm. So it should be fine, but if you want to use Cellometer for alarm, another option is just uh, uh, deploy another Cellometer but only set a very uh, short uh, TTL if mm. you are using Mongo. Mm. Just set it as a very TTL so that you know, after uh, you got the alarm, the, message, uh, the metrics will be deleted by Mongo automatically in a very short time. And, for, and as for billing, I, we are also have a project named uh, Distill. It has been open sourced yet, and it can help you very easy to um, to map to your uh, backend ERP. I think if you are using OpenStack as a public cloud, uh, I assume you have an ERP system to manage your uh, customer and billing invoice, all the stuff. So uh, for our project, it's named Distil. Mm -hmm. In Distil, you can uh, create um, your ERP as a backend so that you can mapping, you can uh, export your uh, invoice quotations and even credits to your customer because I, I assume you have already got some uh, TKs ask, uh, I want to see uh, all the, you know, the invoice history by API mm. and um, I want to see my current balance of my credits or something yeah. like that. How much am I paying this week? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that, that sounds really useful. Um, yeah. uh, I think um, there's a, there's a fishbowl session right after this, and it's downstairs, I think, in room 103? 102, I 102. think it is. Yeah. Um, if, if you can, come down and, and talk to us and tell everybody about that, and we can write that stuff down in an etherpad. That sounds really useful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more questions? Um, one more. Um, you guys were asking about um, the, the public cloud working group and, and, and what to do next. Um, um, I, by the way, disclaimer, I work on the same company of that guy, so I appreciate that we're uh, taking too much time at the <laughs> microphone here. Um, 
the only thing I would like to say is uh, today I went out for lunch uh, with the guys that run the internet cloud and also OVH uh, and, and just realize how much overlap and how much time we're spending exactly on the same problem. Exactly. Mm. Right? So a good start would be let's just get the people that are running this public cloud together. Yep. We can write a little list and say, hey, if we are all fixing the multi-tenancy problem on Trove or the uh, you know, workflow for uh, signing up, creating something that allows people to define a workflow there, uh, maybe we can share this precious development resource that we have and say, okay, we're focusing the two people on this one, the, the rest of the people on this one, and, and, and spread the load a little bit. Mm, no, absolutely. Um, I think that overlap is, is, is not very productive. Mm. Um, so th that would be a good start. Yeah. You know, the, the work group right. doesn't need four months to define what it will do. Uh, we have a little <laughs> list of things that need action right now, uh, and a few developers that each one of us can contribute. So maybe that's a good place to start. Definitely, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, go for it. We're, um, we're good for another 10 minutes, according to my watch. OK. So um, I'm just kind of inspired by watching uh, the VIO presentation, VMware Integrated uh, OpenStack, and wondering why, why they would do it. And the reason they seem to be doing it is for um, just for simplicity. What they do is they go in there with a sort of take the, some of the chaos of OpenStack, if I they use that term, and they frame it off and suddenly make it a lot more approachable. Um, and then I couldn't help but think of Linux itself and how the more technically difficult the problem was, the more Linux seemed to um, attend to it during its you know, developmental years in the 90s and the noughts. And the more user-friendly side of it, the GUI side of it, always seemed to stumble. And I wondered, I don't think they're any more technically difficult. There's probably something about the uh, community, um, the economy uh, of the system that sort of leads to this strange development where the really tough parts and the core, you know, the symmetric multiprocessing and so on, are, are dealt with exceptionally well. And then outside on the edge, you're left with a GUI that, uh, you know, uh, half the time you can't comprehend. And I wonder if we're not seeing the same, you know, when you're looking at at laying out a bit of a future for a public open stack, if we're not seeing the same kind of pattern develop, and if we are, uh, what do you think is behind it? So uh, you're, uh, just to try and uh, understand that in its depth, um, you're saying that uh, open stack behind the scenes is very complicated, uh, but the interface that we put in front of it is not good enough, so. Well, yeah, and I know I could get nailed for that so, probably. Well, no, yeah, it's, sure, it's, it's sure, fine. I mean, uh, sure. you, 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 it, a lot of people don't like uh, Horizon, for instance, if that's what you're referring to. Um, but uh, for example, we created our own control panel mm. totally because uh, Horizon wasn't suitable for our customers. Right. It was too complex right. for them, and uh, yeah, we had to create our own. Yeah, but just the install and the update. I mean, it's something somebody is a relative n newcomer to it all. And uh, sort of over the last year, as you know, tried to expose and understand and so on. What I found was it just it reminded me really of circa 1995 trying to install Linux uh, when we had Linux clubs, and uh, it was and and I always uh, marvelled at how Linux was so brilliant in one way. Uh, I mean, Microsoft was on the run, and the majority of web servers today, you know, Microsoft lost that market because the system just works better. And this technically is more difficult in many ways than just facilitating a front end. Um, that would allow more people to get into it more quickly and maybe move it forward uh, m more effectively. Mm. Uh, it'd, it'd be good to discuss what we think uh, w yeah. that would look like, how we could improve on what we already have. I mean, personally, I don't think Horizon's too bad, but I, I, I guess that comes with a lot of time and domain knowledge, and I probably take it a little bit for granted. I'm sure it puts a lot of people off interacting with it. But yeah, it'd be, uh, be good to define what a good user um, interface would look like. Absolutely. But, but still kind of tricky because OpenStack does a lot of stuff behind the scenes and yeah. we have to try and plug it all together. So yeah. mm -hmm. no, it'd be good to discuss it some more anyway. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in the fishbowl session. Uh, any more questions, please? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Antonio. I work in America Mobile. Uh, and we're in the process of, of uh, building a, a public cloud. Uh, we have built others based on VMware and open virtualization and so on. But what we face with, with those products is that we have to wait a lot to get new features. And every time it's very expensive, right? Yeah. 
And now uh, we're going into extending the cloud with the features missing with, uh, with OpenStack, which was an option. CloudStack is still there, an option as well. Um, we are entangled in, in, in the discussion of which distribution should we use? Because uh, at least in Latin America, there are not so many developers participating in the community. And the skills are, uh, are expensive and are hard to find with. So first question would be, so that was the background, sorry. So is there any recommendation for a public cloud uh, OpenStack distribution? <laughs> and the second would be, do you have your own developer teams? Do you maintain it by your own? Or are you depending on, on a third party? Uh, do you not yeah, go um, first of it? We use the one that comes upstreams. We have early used REO as well. Um, I guess it depends on what you are looking for. If you're looking for getting features quickly, for example, you should probably look for using vanilla. Uh, yeah, basically that, that's a pro yeah, the biggest difference, I think. Um, time to market of, of new features. Um, that's my experience of it, at least. Mm. Yeah, we. Um we run Ubuntu, and we just get uh, uh, we use the puppet um, the puppet well not libraries puppet modules for deploying OpenStack. So we just take whatever um, whatever release we want to deploy, and um, when we deploy it that way, and then uh, we don't get anything sort of vendor specific beyond that. And if uh, if it breaks, we have a team of um, how many people? Nick now eight, seven. We have uh, seven DevOps and developer um, technical type people who can get their hands dirty when it comes to OpenStack and. Yeah, some days we have to just really dive into the code and scratch our heads, and um, we have been in positions in the past where it's hurt us because it's been broken. Um, but we've always been able to fix it. I mean, that's the great thing about being able to get to the source code. Um, and so we'll, we'll put a fix in place, and then we'll try and get that upstream. So that's the way we prefer working, because we, we love details, and we love being able to control everything. Um, and that's worked pretty well for us so far. Thanks. More questions? Have a, two more minutes, right? Two more minutes. No? Okay, no. so we're, uh, we've got a, the link here for the public cloud working group. If anyone wants to get involved, we are on Freenode IRC under the OpenStack public cloud uh, channel. Um, these are our nicknames if you want to send us messages or anything. Um, yeah, as we said, we're having a sh session sh shortly. In 102? Yep, downstairs. And uh, on Thursday, there Thursday is another well. public cloud working group session. Can't remember where or when that is, but it is on the summit schedule. I think um, it's around lunch somewhere. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, if, uh, if you want to have a conversation with us, do come and talk to us afterwards. And uh, thank you very much for coming along and listening. Thank you. Thank you.